Josh, you recently met with European regulators. You've met with many regulators around the world. There's obviously a lot of hype and excitement about Hyperloop, but what's the number one concern regulators have when you talk to them? I think the number one concern has always been this doesn't exist yet, and everyone's used to dealing with rail boats, planes, trains, and everything from that standpoint. And they're trying to think of us in that context. And one of the things that is, well, we're not any of those particular modes of transportation. We're a new mode. So we can draw from the best of that. We can draw from autonomous vehicles, platooning or convoying trucks. But we need to be regulated as our own entity because it's really where the power is because we can create a brand new experience that's based on the technology that we're building. And your company also recently announced intent to build a hyperloop between Pune and Mumbai in India. What would be the biggest technical hurdle to building a hyperloop around that route? And when would an operational demonstration track be put in place? So we're targeting construction to begin really over the next couple years and then passengers operational in the mid 2020s. Um, again, one of the big things there is the regulate, regulation side of the fence. And the things that uh, about that route that are really exciting, there's over 100 million people, almost like 150 million people that travel that route every single year. And a number of our employees actually grew up in that particular area. And so being able to see their parents every day and taking instead of a two and a half or three hour train ride or car ride on a good day, you're dropping that down to 20 or 25 minutes. And then from that standpoint, uh, you're really able to completely revolutionize how people actually live and work in those two cities, which is really, really exciting. And from a challenge standpoint, the biggest thing is there's a, a hill about halfway between the two, a couple hundred meter high. And for us, our technology can easily deal with that. But right now, if you look, there's a ton of switchbacks. It's really slow for the road that actually goes on that spot. So it's, it's pretty exciting that our technology could actually replace that and make it even better. Now, even in this nascent industry, you have competition from Elon Musk's boring company, uh, Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. How do the approaches differ and what are the advantages to each, not just the advantage to your company? Mm. That's a good one. I think for, for us, you know, Elon is focusing on intra-city transport, so within a city itself. So if you look at what he's doing and the Boring Company is doing in Chicago, they're really trying to connect a short distance between the two airports, fully tunneled. Um, and then basically leveraging the technology he already has with Tesla, with the electric vehicles to put large buses inside of a tube and transport people that way. Uh, for our, our ourselves, one of the advantages that we have is a big, large scale. We've got an organization. We've had a significant amount of funding, so we've been able to build the technology. And you know, the one thing that you will do is you will ride this. We will ride this. My kids will ride this. Grandmas will ride this. And for us, it's a huge thing to be able to test it. And so being able to have everyone in one spot building, testing, learning, and then iterating is really important. And you know, one of the other companies believes in a, a crowdsourced model, which I think is a it's an interesting way to do a number of different developments. Like if you look at what software is doing with the open source community and everything, like it's very interesting. Um, I do think that one's a little bit challenging to actually build hardware with though. Now, Bloomberg's reported that you've replaced three board members. A fourth one was charged abroad and your co-founder also recently stepped down. How do you explain all of this? <laughs> Uh, well, it keeps things exciting to say the least, but for, for us, you know, one of the things that's been really important is we've got different levels of funding through the company and throughout time, and as those funding comes in, just like you've seen with boards of other companies, it ends up changing the makeup of the board. So two of the members were uh, that moved off of the board are actually still advisors with the company as part of the fundraising that we did in the fall of last year. Uh, Mr. Magmodedev, who uh, had some issues in Russia, stepped down from the board in May. And then uh, Shervin Pishavar, the former co-founder, basically ended up uh, leaving the board at the end of last year. So we've really come back. You know, Richard Branson has stepped up as the chairman of our board. We've moved into a new process of actually creating a operational. We're trying to commercialize this technology. We're done building prototypes. We're actually building big hardware now. And for us, it's really important to have someone who's done that before with Virgin Trains, Virgin Planes, Virgin Australia, Virgin America, Atlantica, Atlantic. All of those things are really providing quite a bit of value to us as an organization as we move forward. And Josh, one of your former board members controlled uh, Caspian Ventures. Are they still a major backer of the company? Have they sold any shares? 
No. Um, so they're still a major ba backer of the company. They, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Mr. Magmodedev stepped down in May because of the issues that were going on in Russia. Um, they still have their, their shares. They're one of the earliest investors, and they still have a board seat on our, in our company right now. And Musk's boring company is also working on a route in Chicago. They're saying that they can do it all on their own without any government funding. Is there a scenario where that would be possible for you or some sort of public-private partnership? Is that the better route? It's all come, it all comes down to ridership. And the more people that can ride to Hyperloop, the easier it is to get public, or sorry, private financing for that. So one of the big attractive things in India is the amount of riders that are on that route. And if you look at India, there's something like seven or 8,000 kilometers, you know, five, 500 or 5,000 miles of Hyperloop that could be built in India. And there's so many riders, there's so many people moving into cities there that you'll be able to pay for most of those projects you know, through pi private financing because the returns look really good. And so as long as you have a significant, significant amount of riders, and this isn't an insane amount, it's just a, a reasonable amount. So think you know, 10,000 passengers per hour, which is normal for high-speed rails in Europe, that you can easily make a Hyperloop case with uh, you know, pu private financing, public-private partnerships is going to be a big part of our success. And then ultimately, it comes down to the government paving the way for a regulatory aspect and the certification of the route within country.